all of you, thank you very much for welcoming me here. You know, I, my roots are in northern New England, and I'm used to weather like this in the middle of March. And uh, so I feel very much at home. Um, we often have weather in the, uh, that reaches beyond seven degrees uh, in March, and I'm delighted to see that it reached beyond 70 here. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. I'm, I've written a speech um, because they expect me to do that. Um, and I'll go on and deliver it for a while uh, until it looks like, uh, until I get tired of it and I get some indication from you that you're getting tired of it. And then we'll stop and have a conversation and um, we'll use as much time as you like. I have nothing else planned for this evening. Uh, there's no basketball game on and so we're, we're fine. Um, so I'll deliver a, the kind of prepared speech you expect here. But uh, I would like us at some point to wrap up the speechifying and um, to have some questions and some, um, some dialogue amongst us, which can continue, of course, in the reception later and even beyond that. As I say, I have no plans for the evening. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the election. And I can say one thing that uh, I think that will be incontrovertible, and it's this. It's not over yet. Not after 20 debates, not after 10 states voted last week, for Super Tuesday, not after Mississippi and Alabama voted this week, not after millions have been spent and blood's been spilled over negative ads that have soiled the airwaves from Burlington, Iowa to Boise, Iowa, Idaho. Canadian elections are nasty, brutal, and short. American elections are nasty and brutal, but not short. The governing theory behind the Mitt Romney presidential campaign was that he was the only electable candidate in the Republican field. Everything flowed from that thesis. He alone had the money required to fight off rivals in the primaries and caucuses, the moderate profile required to peel swing voters away from Barack Obama, the business experience and acumen to persuade Americans that hopelessness and joblessness were not the country's 21st century fate. And then everything changed. And by changing, almost everything remained the same. Here's what's changed. A US Supreme Court ruling opened the funding floodgates, allowing unlimited expenditures by independent groups that mustered money to mount blistering negative attacks, first against Mr. Romney, and then on Mr. Romney's behalf against everybody else. Faced with a cacophony of voices suggesting he wasn't conservative enough, Mr. Romney turned right, and the sense of economic hopelessness in America began to lift, permitting Mr. Obama's prospects to lift with them. So this is what hasn't changed. Even after South Carolina, even after Mississippi and Alabama, Mr. Romney remains the candidate that Republican voters believe is the most likely nominee, although the prize may be tarnished and its value against a newly reinvigorated president may be diminished. It's likely that the next couple of weeks will be little more than shadow puppetry, providing little relief to all of us who've grown weary of this whole spectacle. Former Senator Rick Santorum of my state won Alabama and Mississippi this week. Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, who won this state in Georgia, will continue to roar from the sidelines on the right and Representative Ron Paul will continue his slog through the primaries without a win. But the man in the whip position remains Mr. Romney, who simply by turning up day after day, remember that what Woody Allen said, you know, 85% of life is turning up. Simply by turning up day after day, state after state, he continues to build up his convention delegates, very likely collecting the 1144 required for nomination by the end of the spring. Sometimes presidential candidates battered by tough nomination fights emerged the stronger for it. Bill Clinton did in 1992. Sometimes, however, candidates worn and weary by the struggle never recovery, especially, especially if the party is left bitter and bruised. Hubert Hunkery in 1968 is a good, chi good poster child for that. Mr. Romney's signature trait is determination, and perhaps he'll emerge from the primaries and caucuses invigorated by victory. But nothing will erase the fact that he won his two biggest triumphs by astonishingly small margins, his home state of Michigan by little more than three percentage points in Ohio a few weeks ago by one point. Mr. Romney almost certainly can't win in November without taking at least one, if not both of those states. And nothing will wipe away the fact, you know well here in South Carolina, that Mr. Romney is performing exceedingly poorly in the South. A modern Republican presidential candidate must count on a near sweep of the old Confederacy. Now, it's often said that U.S. presidential elections are won at the center, not at the extremes of the political spectrum. This is a lesson Mr. Romney knows well. 
for his victory in the Massachusetts gubernatorial election in 2002 was fueled by his image that he cultivated as, as a moderate voice in a liberal state. It's a lesson he learned from his father, the one-time chief of American Motors, a beloved governor of Michigan, and a Republican big shot in the 60s. Now, George Romney in 1964, I found this quote last week. I was, somebody gave me an old Time magazine from 1964 and it had this quote in it. Unlike the ramblers I used to sell, this is George Romney who was the head of American Motors and most of you, none of you students know what a rambler is, but all of you who have gray hair know exactly what I'm talking about. Unlike the ramblers I used to se sell, the Republicans must have a big wheelbase and a big body. Now a lot's changed since the, in the half century since Mitt Romney's father was a Republican leader and ramblers ro roamed the roads, but what we might call the Romney rule still prevails. The Republican rush to the right this winter was prompted by the notion that public impatience with Mr. Obama and with high unemployment and high deficits would reward a conservative alternative to an unambiguously liberal president. Now that theory may still hold, but it seems less assailable in, in, in January than it does now in March. So the candidates will fight on, perhaps for another six weeks, perhaps until California and New Jersey on June 5. And Republicans may increasingly believe they know the identity of their candidate, but neither they or he knows the state of the economy around which the November election will be decided. Now, some uncertainties, as I've mentioned, have been swept away, but the most important ones remain. And along with the uncertainties that remain, we have seen some old certainties swept away. I'm going to go through a few of them. Since 1932, blue-collar workers have been the bedrock upon which Democratic presidential candidates have built their coalitions. FDR drew them into his party and his successors, both winners and losers, have put the votes and interests of blue-collar workers at the center of their campaign calculus and their campaign rhetoric. No more, which is, what, why, which is why what happened in South Carolina made even the sharpest-eyed political experts squint. If the political landscape seems out of focus, it's because there's been a fundamental shift in the topography of American civic life. You might even call it a tremor, if not an earthquake, rumbling through the nation as a result of the 20th century development, this one here. More blue collar voters today identify themselves as Republicans than as Democrats. And this is a significant change, upending all of history from the Roosevelt years on. The Great Depression was blamed on the Republicans, on big bankers, and are industrialists. At the same time, Roosevelt managed through his relief programs to sustain millions of Americans. That bound those workers to the Democrats. That's why the new blue-collar affinity for the Republicans is so important. It's based on compelling Wall Street Journal and NBC News survey data, and its implications are stunning, changing the way we look at the parties and the way the parties shape their messages the way they recruit congressional and gubernatorial candidates, and the way they behave on Capitol Hill, and the way the 2012 election is evolving. But, post, but perhaps most startling of all, poll figures show that as many Republicans as Democrats blame Wall Street for the economic crisis of the nation. All this explains why the Republican uh, candidates, first in Iowa and New Hampshire, and then most pointedly here in South Carolina, undertook a searing and searching critique of capitalism, transforming all of our established beliefs that led us to assume that the Democrats were the party of blue-collar workers and labor, that the Republicans were the party of business and capital. The irony of this is that while the move of the blue-collar workers toward the Republican Party began with Nixon, who in 1968 cultivated voters who, who we called hard hats, and accelerated with Reagan, who deliberately sought votes from Reagan Democrats. The real change in the character of the Republican Party may have come during the House speakership of Newt Gingrich. It was Gingrich, remember the winner here in South Carolina, who bid the GOP to look beyond its usual patrons on Wall Street and on the business roundtable, who tilled new political soil, creating a profile for himself and for the Republican Party as being anti-government but not pro-business. With his ties to information technology industries, which themselves swept away the old assumptions of American commerce, and with a rhetoric of revolution, which was anathema to stability-seeking big business, Gingrich plotted a new path for Republicans. Just as the new entrepreneurs showed contempt for the staid accommodationist world of the old Fortune 500, Gingrich showed contempt for the plodding, go-along attitude of the old GOP. And we had a conversation earlier today, GOP is a shorthand for the Republican Party. 
personified by the House Minority Leader he toppled. So Mr. Gingrich, with greater affinity for the National Federation of Independent Business, which is a small business group, than for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the big business group, may be the true engine of change in Washington and in the broader modern political culture. It was a small leap from Gingrich's positions in 95 to his blistering criticism here in South Carolina of former Governor Mitt Romney as a corporate viper who put profits ahead of people, just the sort of phrase that used to tumble effortlessly from the lips of politicians who were Democrats. Now Barack Obama is putting together a campaign effort that all but writes off the greatest legacy of the president he reveres, Franklin Roosevelt. It's not so much that Obama's temperament that veers him away from blue-collar voters as his reading of the political landscape, perhaps his circumstances. He knows that blue-collar workers have been especially hard hit by the recession, and that definitely affects their views. Even in divided government, Americans blame the president, and as a result, Mr. Obama is assembling a coalition that doesn't depend on the voters that were mainstays of the presidential coalitions of Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, and Clinton. Though it is telling that each president in that string, Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, Clinton, all Democrats, each of those presidents was less committed to the old uh, formula than was his predecessor. Political coalitions change over time, rendering them almost unrecognizable from century to century. The 19th century Democrats with strong religious conservative elements opposed many of the principles now associated with the Democrats, especially a strong central government and civil rights while the Republicans, with a strong elitist and reformist tint, advocated a strong federal government and openness to rights for the newly emancipated slaves. Now the parties, always changing, more often being led than leading, seem to be etching new profiles. The old chestnut that you could always count on blue-collar workers to be Democrats is no longer true, just as the reason for that iron rule of politics that the vast mass of unionized um, voters in auto plants and steel and textile mills has failed, has faded. P parties in and out of office campaign for change, but the biggest change of all sometimes comes within the party themselves. Now here's the second biggest change. If you strip away all the cant from the 2012 Republican nomination fight, you have a front runner who lost most of his, not most, but many of his tests and is barely entitled to the title. A challenger in the race to be the standard bearer of a family values party who's had three wives and no allies, and many blood enemies in his own party. And another contender, Rick Santorum, who lost his own state, considered essential to Republican victory by 18 points in his Senate re-election fight. Now in the old days, a formula like that would be a summons for the political establishment to do something, to do anything, to step in to force implausible candidates from the race, to step forward with a new contender, to step up the pressure to bring order to the proceedings. But none of that has happened, and none of that will happen anytime soon, because it's now possible to contemplate that the party of the establishment, the Republicans, that in the party of the establishment, there is no party establishment, that the caucus of the old guard, no one's on guard. Now, this is the Republican question that dares not speak its name right now, one that suggests that the character of a political party more than a century and a half old has shifted startlingly, startlingly and significantly in the past decade or two. Right now, the Republicans seem to be avoiding the question entirely, speaking obliquely of a party establishment, but never identifying its members or even its inclinations. Indeed, Newt Gingrich, who's a former House Speaker, would ordinarily be regarded as a charter member of the establishment. He's running against the establishment. He said on me for the press the other day, the establishment is right to be worried about me. We're gonna make the establishment very uncomfortable. But here's the secret. There's no establishment left to make uncomfortable or to make things right in a party that seems hungry for someone, something, or anything, or anyone to make things right, or at least to make things clear. The old way of doing things in the Republican Party is gone, said Republican Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire. The party is full of independent contractors following their own instincts. Now, Mr. Gingrich is plainly ineligible to play the part of the establishment. He has the credentials, but not the temperament, and he's one of the contenders in the fight, of course. Mitt Romney has the classic establishment credentials. Former governor of an important state, son, as we've seen, as a of a respected business leader and a revered governor, Nixon cabinet member, and a possessor of dean of degrees from Harvard Law and Harvard Business. But he's in the fight, too. He can't do it. 
Ordinarily, former presidents would be establishment figures, but one of them, George H.W. Bush, is frail and, and is to the new warriors of the GOP a symbol of easy compromise. And the other one, George W. Bush, is still politically radioactive. So if there's a Republican establishment left, it, it occur, consists of the times when Bob Dole, Howard Baker, and Mr. Rudman, three retired senators, get together for dinner. Their average age is 85. None of them has been in office more than recently than 16 years ago. None of the other figures, not Karl Rove, uh, not Charlie Black, neither of whom held major office, qualifies as a party leader. The Republicans have had party leaders like that in the past. Former nominees like Dwight Eisenhower and Thomas Dewey, Richard Nixon, House Majority Leader Charles Halleck, Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen, former House Speaker Joe Martin, but they don't have one now. Because today, neither Senate Majority Leader a minority leader, Mitch McConnell, nor House Speaker John Boehner can play that role. Neither can speak for his entire caucus or for, the, for that matter, for the, even a part of the party. Both are worried about the influence of the Tea Party irregulars. It may be that the modern Republican establishment has been relegated to the presidents of the Rotary Clubs in cities about the size of this one. The Republicans aren't alone, of course. There's no Democratic establishment either. Four years ago, the insurgent Democratic candidate, Obama, defeated the establishment candidate, Senator Hillary Clinton, who had the support of a former president, big labor, and many liberal interest groups. Usually the President of the United States automatically is regarded as an establishment figure, but Mr. Obama shrinks from that role, and as a recent book about the first family suggests, he's uncomfortable with many of the rituals of political life, like sitting around after hours with people he detests and assuring them how important they are. But a party that specialized in toppling the powerful, as the Democrats did, don't need an establishment as much as one that, until recent Democrats practi decades, practiced the conservatism of the old definition, which was resistance to change. That's why in the past, Republicans selected nominees such as Dewey, Nixon, Reagan, uh, Bush, and Dole, all with, co all with uh, conventional c credentials, and each one of them with a presidential campaign, and in three cases, a vice presidential campaign, behind them. The Democratic Republican craving for safety and stability is firmly in the past, which is why the safest and probably least unpredictable among the GOP contenders, Mr. Romney, is so insistently seeking to minimize the very establishment credentials that in 1960 or 1968 would have assured him the nomination without breaking a sweat, which is, of course, the way establishment politicians operate. So amid all, all this change, we're left basically with a couple of Republican contenders here in South Carolina and along the, around the country for a while. It was, it was um, Gingrich and uh, Romney. Now it's probably Santorum and Romney. And uh, the character of the race, the race keeps going on without any apparent resolution. It'll be a while before we do have a, a resolution. Mr. Romney is or has become a conventional 21st century conservative, opposed to taxes, Obamacare, and the notion that humankind has contributed to or can alleviate um, global climate change. Mr. Gingrich, Mr. Santorum hold most of those views most of the time, but they can be uh, counted on grafting an unusual aside or an acidic critique onto their remarks. Mr. Romney would methodically undo Mr. Works, Mr. Obama's work, and Mr. Santorum and Mr. Gingrich would take on the task with relish and with revenge. Mr. Romney's campaign was built the traditional way, slowly and deliberately. Mr. Gingrich's was built the Gingrich way, with volcanic eruptions of energy and ideas, some of them nuts, some of them completely out of sync with the usual rhythms. His is a campaign so unfunded that, that his campaign uh, on, um, no, on 16 days before uh, the New Hampshire primary still didn't even have a headquarters. Now Rick Santorum, how about him? He has spunk, spirit, and now serious political bona fides. He's one of the most remarkable political stories of recent time. A stunning presidential caucus performance in Iowa five years after losing, as I said, his Senate election bid by 18 points. Now his campaign is cloaked in romance and stardust, but he lacks money and organization, which are more prosaic, but often more powerful in presidential politics. He's also fallen victim to the forces and elevated five other contenders to the fore, only to see them all falter under greater scrutiny and formidable negative attacks from others, including Mr. Romney. Until recently, Mr. Santorum was regarded as innocuous, well-meaning afterthought in a V-neck sweater. That stat status ended in Iowa. One more, Ron Paul. 
He's today what he was yesterday, a candidate with a loyal cadre of supporters, but almost no chance of substantially expanding his coalition. The other day, somebody asked me what Ron Paul was like, and I said he was like the beginning of the, um, the uh, ballet uh, music for, uh, for, called the Sabre Dance, which there were 24 consecutive F sharps. He's completely consistent, saying, hitting the same note all the time. And he has a very loyal cadre of people, but it hasn't expanded very much. The danger to the Republicans really is less in his resilience and his determination to remain in the field than the possibility that results like the ones we've been seeing might embolden him to bolt the party and undertake a third party candidacy that could siphon off support from the eventual Republican nominee. Now I can go on because I got five or six more pages of this, but I'm running out of gas. And uh, I suspect that some of you want to contend, uh, contend that I'm full of um, uh, beans here or uh, might, maybe one or two might agree. Uh, so let's have a conversation about the uh, election and, uh, and, and the profile of the con country now as we're in the first election of the second decade of the 21st century. And as we, um, we go to what is probably going to be one of the most important elections in our lifetime, they're all important, of course, but this is a, an election in the middle of a recession with two wars raging and a third on the, on the, uh, uh, potentially on the uh, drawing board with all sorts of uncertainties in the Middle East and around the world with Russia just having uh, brought back to power a, um, a near, dic near dictator or certainly near tyrant uh, uh, Putin and with uh, uncertainty everywhere. So I'm happy to engage in any questions and if they're really hard, of course, I'm gonna evade them. <laughs> so um, just stand up and I'll call on you and we'll, uh, we'll see where, where we go from there. Campaign, so they can, they can, they can um, fund uh, negative barrages against candidates and the candidate can say, well, you know, I'm, I don't know, I had nothing to do with this, and yet 